faithwire.com. Hello and welcome to 4 and 3, a podcast breaking down four of the most important stories of the day and three things you need to know about them all from a Christian perspective. Today's Friday, March 19th, 2021. I'm Dan Andros and coming up on the podcast today, Vladimir Putin challenges Joe Biden to a duel. All right, not exactly a duel, but we'll have the details <laughs> on that. The skillet frontman John Cooper warns that culture is redefining good and evil. A dad, speaking of that, a dad was arrested after refusing to use his 14-year-old daughter's preferred pronouns. And a Vermont professor calls out the growing anti-white racism on college campuses. We will have those stories on this Friday for you with Trey Gons Phillips from faithwire.com. Trey, how are you on this Friday? I'm good. I know it's like so cliche to say because people say it all the time, but I really can't fathom how quickly time moves. Like, how are we <laughs> mid-March, like March 19th? I know. It does really feel if like I the calendar year it, just changed. Yeah. And if I think about it too much, honestly, it just it, it depresses me so I <laughs> to move on from it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Especially when we see the events of the day, uh, yeah. which we are going to dive right on into with this bizarre exchange uh <laughs> with with putin and biden and so uh basically here's putin's salvo he said i want to invite president biden to continue our discussion but on the condition that we do it actually live that was the challenge that he issued uh after a back and forth between the new american president and the longtime russian dictator uh and Chicken Joe is trending on social media right now, so that should kind of give you an indication on how Golly. on how well that challenge is going over with the uh, public so far. But um, but Biden, um, what happened was Biden had issued a warning to Putin saying he'd quote pay a price for attempting to interfere in U.S. elections, um, and then and then Putin responded and said, "I just thought of this now." He said, "I want to invite President Biden to continue our discussion, but." on the condition that we do it actually live with no delays directly in an open direct discussion. Uh, Jen Psaki <laughs> responded saying, uh, I don't have anything to report to you in terms of a future meeting. The president will of course be in Georgia tomorrow and quite busy, mm, super busy. Uh, Biden made, he made headlines this week uh, when he was on with uh, ABC and George Stephanopoulos. And um, he asked, he was asked if, if um, he thought Putin was a quote killer. And he answered, I do. And then Putin responded by saying, it takes one to know one. <laughs> like, okay. Uh, and we thought the pettiness was going to be gone with Trump, uh, the, the petty attacks. But no, they apparently are just going to keep on going. Uh, so a declassified report, this all kind of kicked off when the declassified report on Tuesday was released by the U.S. Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And they found that while no foreign powers, quote, manipulated any election results, huh, we had a nice uh, long four years talking about that, Russia did seek to influence public opinion in opposition of Biden. And Biden said, uh, the price he is going to pay, well, you'll see shortly. Uh, that was Biden's threat. So what's the left saying? Well, Long gone, Trey, are the days when Barack Obama was making fun of Mitt Romney for expressing concerns over Russia being our number one geopolitical mm. foe. If we all remember the famous line from Obama, the 1980s called and want their foreign policy back. Uh, that didn't age very well. Um, Vox spinster Aaron Rupar said that the right is, quote, cheering for Putin. So what's the right saying? Well, Candace Owens said knowing that World leaders are openly mocking the sham of our election results is objectively sad. Buck Sexton said Chinese officials and Putin himself are basically doing donuts on the White House front lawn and calling <laughs> out Biden as a decrepit clown. It's a fitting start for this administration's foreign policy. So uh, why does it matter? Well, it, it matters because obviously all of us are impacted by you know, how America deals with the rest of the world at large. And no president's going to do it perfectly. You know, they're all going to get criticized. But, you know... When sharks smell blood in the water, uh, it's kind of like that. If foreign leaders smell weakness from Biden, they're going to they're gonna push the boundaries of what they can get away with. We saw this with Syria under Obama when he threatened Assad with a red line and then didn't do anything when he crossed it. So Assad kept oppressing everyone. So so there's consequences to this stuff. And um, 
Uh, that's just one example of it, but uh, it, it does matter. And, you know, there are legitimate concerns about um, how Biden is going to deal with these foreign leaders. Yeah. And I think that was a big concern among a lot of people was Biden's potential foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, lucky for him, was something that he never actually had to discuss because nobody in the <laughs> debates and nobody in interviews ever even right, asked him about it. Convenient. Uh, you know, and he rarely did any interviews uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh, but also, I think this kind of shows that the similarities between uh, Trump and Biden. Uh, you know, everybody is talking about how Trump was so immature and it, everything was just a food fight. Uh, I mean, but Biden was also the one who I think it was on during a campaign speech, maybe in, in uh, 2020, maybe mm -hmm. 2019. Uh, when uh, Biden said that he wanted to take Trump behind a, a shed or you know, right. out back or yeah. something and like he, and beat him up. Yeah, he would have punched. He would have punched him if he was in high school or something like that. Yeah, so it's yeah. like they're actually there's there's some similarities uh, in their rhetoric uh, yeah. that we're seeing now. So I just we'll see if uh, if Biden's able to <laughs> do it as well as as Trump was, who was kind of a uh, interestingly, kind of surprisingly to me, an, an isolationist type guy yeah uh during his term in office so and i don't think a lot of americans are going to be on either side of the aisle would be too happy about going back into to new wars uh, no. at this point after four years of pretty much avoiding them all together yeah yeah and there is something to be said too for you know i think foreign leaders you know when you got a bit of a loose cannon there in the white house i mean i think yeah they're gonna think twice about what they're doing because they right. know uh, you know, they test Obama, they tested, um, and Obama didn't never pull the trigger on some operations. He certainly did. Um, yeah. So, you know, you've got to, you can't be all bark and no bite, basically, yeah. or else people are going to walk all over you. So, yeah, that's true. All right. Story number two. Uh, Skillet frontman John Cooper uh, explained in a new video this week that the explicit Grammy performance last Sunday by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion uh, reveals at least to him how our culture has begun to redefine good and evil uh so for anybody who didn't watch it and i don't recommend going to watch it uh the two uh scantily clad female artists uh <laughs> basically simulated sex yeah. uh, during their choreography for an obscene song uh called wop uh, and officials with the federal communications commission actually said wednesday uh, that they've received dozens of complaints uh in the wake of the performance uh, so Cooper said that uh, we're seeing Isaiah 520, which says, woe to those who say evil is good and good is evil, play out in secular society. Uh, we're living in a world right now where there are certain Dr. Seuss books that you cannot sell on eBay, Cooper said. They're just too much for anybody to even be allowed to buy. They're being yanked down from all the bookshelves and stuff like that. It's just too much. It's too evil. Uh, so you can't go on eBay and buy it, but you can and must applaud the sexual degradation of Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion <laughs> simulating sex together on the Grammys. Uh, the Christian recording artist uh, used Nazi dictator uh, Adolf Hitler uh, to show just how effective it can be to redefine good and evil. Uh, the question is, who is going to define what is good and who's going to define what's evil, Cooper asked. Every dictator in history says that... Uh, says that what they are doing uh, is good that what that's what they believe if you go back and you read some of hitler's speeches he's like i'm gonna see pe i'm gonna set people free free from the bondage of the ten commandments in his mind he's a liberator it's always like that uh cardi b and megan the stallion's performance last weekend uh is what ha happens when you redefine evil when you redefine good he added so what's the left saying? Well, one media outlet, Consequence of Sound, which is actually where I first saw this, totally misrepresented Cooper's comments <laughs> completely. Uh, it ran a story claiming Cooper equated the Grammys with Hitler speeches. Ugh. That's not at all what happened. Gosh. He didn't say that at all. He, he made a point about us redefining evil and good. He used an example of Hitler saying, look, Hitler redefined good and evil. And then he said that we're in a culture that's redefining good and evil. And that's what... Uh, Cardi B's Grammy performance was didn't call the Grammys Hitler speeches. No, not uh, at all. But anyway, that's what some outlets are saying. <laughs> so what's the right saying? Well, several conservatives have also condemned the really explicit performance. Matt Walsh and Candace Owens, both at the Daily Wire, have spoken out uh, against the objectification and sexualization of women's bodies, particularly in a Me Too era. 
uh, and in an era right now with the Black Lives Matter movement, when we're supposed to be pursuing justice uh, and equal treatment and equity, uh, they called out that double standard there. Uh, so why does it matter? The truth is we are living in a time of cultural relativism. And Cooper, Cooper's example about Hitler goes back to the fact that Hitler subscribed to the Marxist belief uh, that there's no overarching moral truth, that the rules are, are kind of are determined by whoever's in charge, uh, which was him at the time, uh, and that people needed to be set free from some encroaching over, you know, overall overarching moral truth, uh, absolute morality. Uh, and I'm not at all saying that that's where we are. We're not in Nazi Germany. We're not, you know, we're not at that place. Uh, but we are embracing a similar cultural worldview, which is that objective truth can't really be known. Uh, instead, we have her truth and his truth or my truth. Uh, truth has just become this subjective thing that we toss around. Uh, it's not the facts that matter. It's how they're perceived and by whom. Uh, but as Christians, you know, we know there's a fundamental moral truth that's threaded throughout all of our existence. Uh, in a sense, that should kind of take the pressure off, I think, because we don't need to to fear some sort of evil tyrant coming in and redefining for us what is good and evil. Yeah, but we do have to stand up against this cultural pressure, this increasing yeah. cultural pressure we're feeling to give in to these redefined terms. Because if we're not careful, and this is the, the biggest fear that I have and what we've talked about, Dan, hmm. uh, is that if we're not careful at guarding against this, it's going to creep its way into the church. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think we've seen that happening to to some extent already. Um, yeah. And it's just people have taken their, honestly, they've taken their thinking caps off. We are now a bunch of emotionally reactive people who just, I, I mean, I, I read that blog post uh, that from that outlet that you cited there, Trey. And I think in the same sentence, they criticized Cooper's, you know, illogical, you know, position and then immediately said, and it sure sounds like a lot of censorship there that he's pro censorship. He doesn't say anything about censorship in there. I mean, that's he right. just makes no. that up and makes an illogical leap in the same sentence where he criticizes Cooper's, you know, logic. And um, and so I, people just aren't thinking now. We're just so reactive. Oh, my gosh. They said Hitler uh, must be bad, you know, and they don't even think they don't even yeah. think. So we're, we're not a and thinking society. We're a mob reactive society. I, I think it's. It's just lazy because it misses Cooper's overall point. Yeah. His point yeah. was not that, that Cardi B's was performance Nazi. should be yeah. censored. Yeah. His or point censored, was yeah. we should we should be in a culture where we collectively agree that that kind of performance is not acceptable. Right. right. He was talking about good and evil. And they just like the point just that think of that meme where the points flying over the stick figure's head and the stick figure's just looking at it like what's that? Yeah. <laughs> like that's what's happening here. Like completely miss the point And you're yelling about something that's not honestly not even objectionable. It's right. just now people see, oh, they said Nazi, compared it to Nazism, let's cancel them. So, right. I mean, this is, if that's the society you want to live in, great, but I, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be fun no. for anybody. No. So, all right. And uh, this next story, man, this is something else right here. So buckle up uh, because the details on this one are quite something. A, a Canadian man was arrested this week after violating... Uh, a court order that banned him from speaking publicly about his biological daughter's gender transition. She's 14. There's apparently a court order barring publications from naming this guy. Uh, the Post Millennial did, so I'm not going to do it because I don't really feel like getting dragged into court in Canada. I'm not, not even <laughs> sure if that's possible, but I'm just not going to risk it. Uh, so you can find better out. Better safe than sorry. Yeah, better safe than sorry. So, um, but, uh, so this father was found in contempt of court. Uh, and was arrested on Tuesday for calling his daughter his daughter and publicly referring to her with the pronouns she and her. Um, so he opposed his child's uh, undergoing a, quote, gender affirmative medical procedure and has stated his opposition again and again in the hope of saving his child from irreversible harm. Uh, here is what the father said. Here I am sitting there as a parent watching a perfectly healthy child be destroyed. And there's nothing I can do but sit on the sideline and according to Justice Bowden at the time, cheer it on. I can only affirm or get thrown in jail. Yeah, I can only affirm wow. or get thrown in jail. So imagine the despair of that father there. Back back in December, he was compelled uh, by the court to, to um, uh, collude and assist in his the gender transitioning of his 14-year-old daughter and told not to call her um, 
you know, his biological female. He's told not to call her his daughter. Sorry, the, the pronoun thing gets confusing. Um, in response, he made a, a challenge engaging his right to freedom of speech. Um, and so uh, th there are so many details in the story and they're all insane. Here are some of the craziest ones. So, uh, but you can read the whole stories on the post millennial. Um, and I think we'll have it up on faith wire maybe later today. Um, but his marriage to the child's mother had broken up. So there was some trauma in the family. And, uh, he said that in middle school, grades five and six, his daughter was getting into trouble and hanging out with boys. So they arranged for her to see the school counselor. Uh, and then by seventh grade, he noticed she cut off her long hair and started wearing a toupee. He said that she developed intense crushes on two male teachers and even made a suicide attempt. Um, and he discovered that the school had been showing his daughter something called SOGI 123, uh, the Going Sexual and Gender Identity Education Materials. That's what they are uh, in British mm -hmm. Columbia. And they amount to what he says are transgender ideology, quote, propaganda videos. And so by the seventh grade yearbook, the child was referred to in the yearbook by a different name. The school counselor changed the child's name without telling her parents. The school wow. socially transitioned the biologically female child on their own initiative with the input of a gender ideologue psychologist, Dr. Wallace Wong. Um, they have a gender identity activist lawyer named Barbara Finley who represented the child in court. And the court decided that the child's best interest lay in destroying her long-term health and making her body appear more like that of a male. So just unbelievably tragic for this father and this child who's only 14 years old and, the, and these quote-unquote adults leading uh, her in this direction. So what's the left saying? Well, there's all kinds of debate raging in the comments section under there and in, uh, and in different publications. One psychologist uh, responded to Jordan Peterson, who I'll get his comment in a second, but this guy responded and said, Dr. John Grohl, and he said, um, it's disturbing that the psychologists like Jordan Peterson are apparently defending, quote, the emotional abuse of one's child. Um, so he, he called it emotional abuse to stop mm. her from transitioning. Jordan Peterson, on the other hand, said this, this could never happen, said those who called my stance against Bill C-16 alarmist. That's a Canadian bill with the transgender rights. Um, he said, I read the law and said that it was, to the contrary, inevitable. And here we are. So why does it matter? Well, this issue clearly matters because children's lives are at stake. I mean, lives are being ruined. I mean, they're being fed yeah. a lie, Trey. Irreversible mistakes are being made because of a sick, twisted, and honestly, demonic ideology that calls, ironically, like your last story, evil, good, and good, evil. Yeah, I, it's it's scary to think that that this stuff is happening not that far from us in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which Canada has seemed Man, to have just had off the one rail. heck of a year. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, also we shouldn't take too much comfort in in thinking, well, that's just in Canada, right. uh, yeah. because we're having similar stuff happening here. We just, I think it was last month, maybe a month before last, uh, had an article uh, on faithwire.com about Virginia actually. Uh, is pushing these policies, and I just pulled up the article because I, I didn't remember all the details, but the policies which are pro-transgender policies, uh, which were established with the input of just one parent, uh, urge educators to hide an underage child's gender <laughs> identity or transgenderism Jeez. from his or her parents Man. if they're not supportive of their child's decision. So this same kind of thinking is is happening in the United States, and we're seeing it more and more and it's just, it's a good reason to keep your kids out of public schools if you can. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, if that's an option for you. Uh, yeah. Or to, or to just, if, and if it's not an option, uh, then be in the PTA, be really involved and like day in and day out, know yeah. what your kid yeah. is, is, is consuming and being, being exposed to. Yeah. And even if you're not, you know, if you can't do that, I mean, just, just talk to your kids every day because go over their material. You can't just go on yeah. with, uh, with the, with the blinders on and just wake up two years later and go, Oh goodness, the school's transitioning yeah. my kid. What happened? Like you, you got to get involved. So yeah. yeah. Um, and it, you're right. It's Canada, but man, they're, you know, they're not, we're not far behind. So 
the, yeah. these things it's worth showing because yeah it's it's not us right now but we're not far i mean that's the direction we're going you know you see culture agreeing with so many of those principles so it's plausible we could be on the same track yeah absolutely so I feel like this this uh, episode we're keeping in theme with the good evil evil good <laughs> yeah, thing yeah. here. <laughs> so for the fourth story, uh, a professor of counseling at the University of Vermont uh, is calling awareness to what he sees as a growing trend of anti-white racism on college campuses, uh, and now students are, of course, no, not a shocker, demanding his resignation. Uh, so Dr. Aaron Kinsvader. I'm not certain how to pronounce his last name, but that's what I'm going with. Uh, he posted a video to YouTube on March 8th. Uh, in the nearly 10 minute long speech, the educator said he was first told about whiteness by uh, a faculty colleague who he said offered to help him with it like it was some kind of disease. Uh, the process, the professor said, was dehumanizing. Uh, he went on to say he never expected CRT uh, critical race theory to endure and grow like it has because it's so obviously discriminatory. Uh, so whiteness falls under the umbrella in the derogatory meaning of the word uh, of critical social justice, the professor said, and whiteness, the thinking that informs it, is so crude and so lacking in infalsifiability, and it speaks so eloquently to our tribal impulses that the same logic that informs what's currently being called whiteness right now can easily find its way to desperate persons who need a group to hate and who will adopt the suppositions that form whiteness toward their own end. Uh, so basically he warned that ideologies like CRT will eventually find their way to hate groups, yep. uh, to be used against people of all ethnicities in violent ways. Uh, Kinsvader said that the University of Vermont is pushing to embrace more critical race theory, uh, philosophy, and Ibram Kendi's definitions of the words racist and anti-racist. And Kendi is kind of like one of the biggest promote, promoters yeah. of, of CRT right now. Yes. Uh, so if this policy is passed and speaking up against what many would consider to be anti-racist teaching, uh, but is one that makes a casual connection, uh, a causal connection between people of a particular race and vaguely defined societal ills, he said, I would be considered in a way that is consistent with program policy, a racist. <laughs> He went on to say, do you see how clever this ideology is at protecting itself? It makes it impossible to dissent uh, from on pain of being labeled a racist yeah. and on pain of being ostracized. So what's the love saying? Well, obviously critical race theory and the you know this woke culture is a product of the left. Uh, and more than 3,000 people have signed a petition on change.org to force the professor's res resignation because, and this is, directly from the, the, the petition, uh, the counselor should not be permitted to hold such an opinion because it's harmful. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the harmful stuff, man. We'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. You know. Uh, so what's the right saying? Well, Kinsvader is kind of is just echoing what a lot of conservatives have said, uh, like Glenn Lowry and uh, John McWhorter. Lowry is a professor at Brown University, I believe, and he's been, you know, kind of sounding the alarm on this kind of stuff. He said, kendi has been around for a long time. CRT has been around for decades. Uh, and it's never been something that's really been thought to be applicable directly in real life. It's just a philosophy, uh, but, but we're starting to see it applied nevertheless. So why does it matter? Well, Kinsvader makes a really good point uh, that we've talked about here before, Dan, which is that CRT and the you know, critical race theorists have really uh, successfully insulated themselves. Uh, from any sort of criticism yeah. or critique, uh, because it's just, you know, if they, any sort of critique of them uh, is just the work of a racist or an oppressor. Uh, and that's why it scares me so much to see churches embracing this kind of philosophy, mm -hmm. because it's so toxic. Uh, you know, we should be able to talk about injustice and sin in church, of course, uh, from the pulpit, we should be able to discuss racism and sexism and all kinds of other abuses, because wherever there are humans on this side of eternity, there's going to be sin. Yeah. And racism and sexism, those are all sins. Uh, but we can talk about those from Scripture. We can use the gospel uh, to weed that out. We shouldn't have to turn to a fundamentally racist toolbox uh, <laughs> like critical race theory yeah. uh, to figure out how to deal with it. Because CRT at its core is antithetical to the gospel because it makes people... Uh, it, it, it defines them solely by the color of their skin. It yeah. makes that their deepest and greatest mm -hmm. value, which is so, so antithetical to yeah. scripture. Yeah. And you talk about like, how do we 
get closer as as a people and how do we unify better and this just doesn't seem like the way to do it at all yeah. it just seems like it's fundamentally going to take take us in the opposite direction because even these so-called tough conversations and the honest conversations you know i think there was that one doing series with a yeah doing the work but it was like uh, tough conversations with a black man or something like that and all that mm -hmm. all that stuff is is them a crt proponent lecturing that's not yeah that's not a conversation that is a that is a you know a beat down basically is all it is right. it's just take your beating do your work you guys are bad here's why own up to it like that that, that doesn't seem productive to anyone and honestly it's anti-intellectual to have that kind of vicious loop you talked about there where you can't criticize it or else that's also racist like that's a very convenient out there and uh, makes them impervious to any criticism. You, well, you you criticize it. You must be a racist who doesn't want to do the work. It's yeah. uh, it's it should be a red flag that that they don't want a discussion. And maybe if we have a discussion, we'd find some flaws here um, because it's just not even allowed. You have to sit and listen, and you go do the work because you're the problem. Uh, let me yeah. educate you. It's <laughs> it's uh, it's not healthy at all, and um, not going to take us to a good place. Yeah, and I mean, I, I know that if I'm if somebody is dealing anecdotally with some instance of racism or sexism or whatever, scripture, like I'm not going to be able to pull a Bible verse that's going to heal them. Right, but right. The principles of scripture. Right. We need to check the philosophies we're using against the principles of scripture, and if right. they're not in, they're not compatible, then it's a bad idea. Right. Exactly. All right. God bless. Have a great weekend. We will see you guys back here on Monday. Take care.